Okay, hello everyone and uh, welcome to the second session of the second day of IPM Advanced School on Computing 2020. So in this session, uh, we have uh, our speaker, Sayed Mohsen Musavi Desrui. He is a postdoctoral researcher in the Institute for Machine Learning at ETH Zurich. His research interests probably include machine learning, computer vision, signal processing. Uh, he's currently uh, focuses on the analysis of the robustness of classifiers and its connection with the geometry of deep networks. He received a PhD in computer and communication science at EPFL in Switzerland. And uh, he also interned for, in the Apple AI research in 2017. He also has an MSc degree in communication systems from EPFL and a Bachelor uh, of Science in Electrical Engineering from the American University of Technology. And he will talk um, about the geometric indu inductive uh, bias of deep architectures. Looking forward to see his uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salam. I'm excited to have the opportunity to present my research today. And I would like to thank the organizers for such a wonderful workshop. I know that's quite difficult uh, to have speakers from all around the world and very different time zones. So I guess you did a great job. Congrats on that. Um, and I wish everybody is well and healthy and we are masked. Great, so today I want to talk about some of my current research. Um, I mean, the, the kind of general theme would be revolving around um, kind of the, the inductive bias of deep neural networks and some sort of geometric properties that uh, the, site, the state of the art deep neural networks have. Um, it will be divided in two parts. The first part, I will talk about um, some robustness properties. That's kind of, you know, my expertise. Uh, and in the second part, uh, I will talk about some simple, essentially, um, observation uh, that we had recently made. And I hope that it will be useful, uh, at least for some of you. Okay, let's begin. The title of my talk is Geometric Inductive Bias of Deep Networks. It will become clear what I mean by geometry and by inductive bias, but I hope that it's already clear what I mean by deep neural networks. Cool, let's begin our adventure. So you might have heard the term bias in different contexts related to machine learning, like statistical bias, algorithmic bias, social bias, inductive bias, and so on and so forth. These are different notions of biases that sometimes we wanna avoid them and sometimes we wanna incorporate in our learning algorithms. The one that I'm gonna talk about today is the inductive bias, though it's connected somehow to some other sort of biases, but today I'm not gonna talk about such connections and only I will talk about the technical side of the inductive bias. So let's make it a bit more clear that what I mean by inductive bias. Let's assume that we have a learning task like classification. So we have a model that has a bunch of parameters. For example, in the case of neural networks, we have a network architecture that has weights and biases. So let's call the space of all possible classifiers that we can get um, from our model by changing you know, its parameters as the hypothesis space. So essentially, each point in this hypothesis space would correspond to a specific, a specific set of weights. So when we do kind of a training, for example, a neural network, essentially we, we start somewhere random in this hypothesis space, let's say, and, and then you know our learning algorithm tries to investigate this hypothesis space till we reach some solution that is actually good for classifying our data set. So essentially, of course, you know, if I start from some other initial point, I might, you know, end up at some other solutions. And also if I use some, uh, some other sort of algorithms, I might end up in other solutions. And when I say solutions, it means that 
all these solutions, they achieve zero training error. So they can classify perfectly our training data points. So what's different about them? So generally speaking, these different solutions can be different in terms of their, for example, generalization properties or in terms of the robustness properties that they give us. So keep in mind that you know one training data, tra set of training data points can be classified in many different ways. So, so these different solutions exactly correspond to such concept. But what's different about them is the fact that they generalize differently to unseen data points. For example, to the test set. Let's see a simple example for linear classifiers. So if I have a linear classifier, um, essentially, let's say our model is a linear classifier. So the parameter that I have for a linear classifier, let's say it doesn't have a bias, it would be the normal vector to the separating hyperplane because it's a linear classifier. So each point in my hypothesis space would correspond to one separating hyperplane. And of course, if I have some data set like, um, let's say, you know, we ha I have a, some data set like that, this is class minus one and this is class plus one. Of course, not all of these solutions are good ones for this data set. Though many of them can manage to classify the training set with 0% error. I mean, as you can see, there are many kind of separating hyperplanes. But of course, in terms of generalizing to unseen data points, maybe there is a kind of test data point here that belongs to class uh, minus one. You know, some of them, they do a pretty good job. And some of them, they might get the data set wrong. Sorry, the data point wrong. Okay, so this is what I mean by the inductive bias. So it's like, what are the sort of um, solutions? Because there, are, it, it seems that there are like many different solutions uh, for, for a given problem. So which one of these solutions is kind of preferred by our networks and learning algorithms? And what are the sort of properties that this preferred solution has, for example, in terms of robustness. That was about the inductive bias. Now let's see what I mean by the geometry or more specifically by the input space geometry. Let's assume that we have a network, we have a neural network. And you know, as, in, as an input, it accepts uh, like images and it spits out out you know, the predicted uh, class. So an input image to a neural network can be represented as a vector in a, in a d-dimensional Euclidean space. For example, if uh, the width of image is w and the height is h, so essentially d would be w times h. So one image, one input would be just one point in this d-dimensional Euclidean space. So another image the, uh, that I might have, it would be another point. And another one would be, again, like an x double prime. So now if I have a data set, let's say, you know, this set of cats and dogs. So what I will have is like a set of data points. We, each one of them is essentially like one image. And the task of the network would be to classify a decision boundary in a way that it can separate the data points belonging to these two different classes. If we put it uh, into the picture of inductive bias that uh, we have seen, so in the hypothesis space of neural networks, let's say, you know, we might have different solutions for our toy data set. Essentially, as you can see, you know, uh, and we can we can classify, you know, like that, you know, by having this a small kind of boundaries, this kind of bubbles, or you know, we can have some 
kind of smoother uh, decision boundary or something like this or something like that. Of course, all of them, they achieve zero training error because I mean, these are my training samples and you know, they are perfectly kind of separated. But in terms of maybe robustness properties and generalization properties, each of these solutions would be different. So now the question is that, if I train a neural network, what would be the properties uh, of, the result, of, the, of, the, of the resulting solution that I get? And also, maybe there is, if there, if, if there is a dependence on the data set, um, on the type of solution that, that, that I get, I want to know. I want to know that you know my network uh, works on which types of data set and on which types of data, data set it might not work. So today I, my talk will be divided in two parts. The first part will be about the, no, the robustness of the, uh, of the solutions obtained by a state-of-the-art neural network trained on natural images. So essentially uh, I will talk about the, the notion of directional robustness or spectral robustness, which tells us about like the, the, the geometric properties of the decision boundary uh, of the state-of-the-art neural networks. In the second part, we try to answer the qu as question or find a partial answer to the question that what type of data sets are easier to learn for a state-of-the-art neural networks and what type of data sets are more difficult to learn for these networks. So let's begin with the first part, spectral robustness. So let me begin with an example. Maybe the first time you saw the adversarial perturbations, the perturbations that um, when we add them to, to, the, to the input image, our network misclassifies the resulting uh, perturbed image. So you wonder that they look like kind of high frequency patterns. Some people, at least in the early days, uh, like or well, five years ago, they were hypothesizing that, you know, essentially the adversarial perturbations, they are kind of high frequency perturbations. They, they create some synthetic edges. And since, you know, the first layer of neural networks, they are kind of edge detectors, then um, they got, you know, the, the input image wrong because, you know, there, there are some synthetic edges and, you know, they got fooled by them. And, and then, you know, they would conclude that neural networks are more fragile to high frequency perturbations than the low frequency ones. Here, uh, we have this beautiful image of the cat and I have computed two adversarial perturbations. One that is um, mostly consisted of um, low frequency perturbation, low frequency um, harmonics, and, and one that is consisted of high frequency ones. And as you can see, at least in terms of L2 norm, uh, you need a much smaller uh, magnitude in, in, uh, for this perturbation, for the low frequency ones, compared to, uh, to the high frequency ones, in order to fool the classifier. So if I add uh, this perturbation to my image, the, the image of the cat that I have, the classifier get the image wrong, and wrongly classifies it, for example, classifies it as a dog. So you see that, you know, the norm of this perturbation is smaller. So it means that, you know, it's easier to fool neural networks um, with low frequency perturbations. Okay, this was a qualitative example, but let's make this idea a bit more formal. So let's assume that we have trained a neural network on images or whatever data set you like. Now, X is one of the data points and BF is the boundary or decision boundary that is learned by this network. Recall that adversarial perturbations or unconstrained adversarial perturbations are, the, are minimal perturbations that when added to the original image X, um, they cause the, the resulting perturbed image to be misclassified. So as you can see here, for example, that you know when I add delta A, delta to, to delta to the x, then, you know, the resulting um, image would be, would lie on the other side of the decision boundary, and it would be misclassified. So these perturbations are, as I said, unconstrained. There is no constraint on delta. 
So we can, uh, the delta, the only constraint, it's like the delta should belong to RD, which is it's kind of equivalent to, to no constraint. So similarly, we can define constraint or subspace constraint perturbations. The perturbations that are um, confined in the subspace that passes through our data point X. Of course, this time, if you know if it's we constrain the perturbation to lie on the subspace S, of course, you know the resulting perturbation would be different. And if we choose, uh, for example, another subspace like S prime, I will get some some other perturbation delta S prime. So we can choose some. We can construct by, by, by this method, we can construct some structure perturbations. For example, we can choose S to be some low frequency harmonics and compute, compute low frequency perturbations, or uh, we can choose S prime to be like uh, the high frequency um, harmonics, and then you know, we get high frequency perturbations. So, and, and of course, by doing by, by measuring uh, the norm of perturbations uh, that we get, we can measure the sort of a notion of directional robustness or kind of spectral robustness uh, to adversarial perturbations. To make this idea uh, more precise, we actually choose uh, construct these subspaces based on DCT basis. Of course. If we, have a, if we have a DCT basis uh, for our uh, D-dimensional Euclidean space, um, you know, we'll have like something like um, the, the lowest frequency component till the highest frequency component and everything in between. So, and by choosing subspace S to be a span of, you know, a group of this uh, perturbate, sorry, the gr group of these basis vectors, we can have, uh, we can kind of cover, you know, perturbation, adversarial perturbations in different frequency bands. So for example, you know, if I choose subspace S and to be like the, the, the first 16 harmonics, I mean the lowest frequency ones, uh, so my perturbation uh, delta S would be a linear combination of those and indeed it would be a low frequency perturbations and its norm would indicate uh, the robustness to low frequency perturbations. Uh, and if I choose something here, which are like the, the highest frequency harmonics, then uh, I will have something, um, something higher frequency so from the, the highest possible frequency perturbation, let's say, uh, of course, with this window. And so what we can do is that, you know, we can do it in a systematic way. We take a network, and we compute this delta uh, perturbation for these different subspaces, like taken, you know, from uh, from uh, like uh, this this kind of uh, groups of essentially harmonics, DCT harmonics, and uh, and we kind of measure the norm of these subspace perturbations uh, corresponding to different subspaces. And of course, we create, we compute this quantity, and we average these quantities uh, for uh, for a given subspace. We average this quantity uh, over uh, several input images. Okay, as you can see here, um, I have computed exactly what I said um, for three networks. Let's take a look at MNIST. So, as you can see in this plot. You know, uh, the x-axis represents essentially like you know, the, uh, the frequency bands that I, I am computing the, uh, the robustness. And, and, and the y-axis would be the kind of like the, the, this average, uh, average norm of uh, this delta perturbations. Of course, confined in, 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 in the corresponding frequency band. And as you can see, um, if we look at the robustness in high frequencies, it is much larger than robustness in low frequencies. There is the same trend uh, for ImageNet. For CIFAR-10, we have a different trend. Of course, there is not, not much difference between low and high frequencies. I don't know exactly what, what's going on in this case. Um, 
but but at least we can say that for uh, I guess the, the, or for SVHN also it looks like it looks uh, like MNIST and ImageNet. But 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 anyway, I guess C ten in this case it's a it's it might be an outlier, um, or I don't have any good explanation for that. But anyway, now we can ask this question: whether uh, the fact that you know they become at least MNIST and ImageNet they have become more robust in high frequencies, is it due to the inductive bias that our neural networks have? Or is it due to the data set? And of course, you know, there is an inductive bias uh, in neural network that, you know, it follows, you know, whatever it sees in our data set. So the features are, you know, in our data set, in, uh, there are some, some way that um, essentially we get higher robustness to high frequencies than low frequencies. So to test this hypothesis, uh, we can do the following fun experiment. So let's say we take one of, the one of these data sets, say ImageNet, and what we do is that we try to flip uh, the frequency content of our images. So let me uh, explain it by, by, a, by kind of a 1D example. Let's say you know, we have a signal like that, so if we compute its uh, frequency um, content, it might look like something like that. And then uh, what we do is that by flipping is that, you know, we kind of flip the frequency content. It's like, you know, we, we have made like the, the high frequency ones to the lower frequency part and lower frequency part, we move it to the higher frequency part. And then, you know, if we go back uh, uh, to the, a spatial domain, and then, you know, what we get, you know, we get some different signal. And we do exactly the same procedure, of course, in, for these two-dimensional signals. And as you can see, you know, in, in, the, in the bottom row, I have, uh, I have put some visual examples of how, you know, this, this kind of flipping operator um, uh, will look like. We train on these flipped images. So we have trained the, uh, we, we have flipped the images, the training images for ImageNet, and we kind of uh, we train the same network that we had trained on original images, this time on the Philip images. And now we try to kind of uh, measure uh, the, spec uh, the spectral robustness of this new network. So as you can see here, the top row is the one that we have already seen, and on the bottom row, something uh, quite interesting happens. For example, let's let's compare the one of the MNIST. Uh, the one that that was trained on original data set, it was it had higher robustness to high frequency perturbation, while the one that is trained on flipped MNIST, uh, it has higher robustness to low frequency perturbations. So it seems that as we have kind of flipped uh, our data set, so we have so, some, somehow we have flipped uh, the features in our data set and, and the resulting network robustness also has been flipped. So it may, may be, you know, saying that, you know, the, the neural networks has a tendency to create um, robustness to, uh, to high frequency perturbations might not be completely right. Uh, actually, it seems that they follow, you know, the content of, the, of our data set. So by flipping the content of our, our data set, also the, ro the, the robustness behavior has changed. We see, you know, more or less similar trends for uh, the other two data sets. What was the possible explanation? So let's, co let's consider some um, simple data set. I created a data set like that. I, uh, I create two Gaussians that, you know, uh, I, choose, I choose a direction you want, I mean, some random direction maybe, and uh, in, in this, uh, this RD, the, the input space, and then I create a data set um, of two Gaussians that are actually, they have, uh, they, their mean is separated by U1, and, and they're kind of, they have variance, um, everywhere except uh, in the direction uh, of U1. So essentially their variance would be in the directions that are orthogonal to U1, which are like now D minus one directions, of course. Now you see that, and, and you know, one of them it's class plus one and the other one is class minus one. So now we train, let's say, a fully connected network 
on, on this data set. So it might land some boundaries like that. And then what we do is that we measure um, the robustness, the directional robustness uh, for the direction of U1 and for the direction are, that are you know, orthogonal uh, on U1. What's quite interesting is that the robustness in the direction of U1 is much smaller than the, the robustness in the directions that are orthogonal to U1. So it seems that um, neural networks has the inductive bias of making, to, to become invariant in the directions that there is no discriminative information. As you can see here in our toy data set, of course the discriminative information only lies along U1. Anything orthogonal to U1 is just pure noise. So maybe th then the reason that you know, the neural networks um, trained on, um, on MNIST ImageNet, they are more robust to high frequency perturbation is the fact that you know, there are not much information in that part of the spectrum. And it, somehow it makes sense because we know that the images, uh, most of the informative, uh, uh, informative features, they lie on the low frequency parts of the spectrum. So neural networks, they try to become invariant so indeed, the robustness to high frequency perturbations would be much larger than the low frequency ones where the, the, the important information lies. So as the last thing um, in the first part of my talk, uh, I want to talk about the role of adversarial training and what adversarial training does um, uh, to the uh, spectral robustness of deep architectures. Recall that adversarial training is something um, that, that differs from a standard training in that, so we compute the perturbed samples and then you know, we, uh, we do training on them. And indeed, it kind of um, uh, increases the robustness to adversarial perturbations. So what's interesting is that now if we train networks adversarially on these our three beloved data sets, it's quite interesting to see that, you know, the robustness to high frequency per perturbation would increase significantly, even for CIFAR-10, that before, you know, uh, it, it's just here, the before, you know, was different than ImageNet and MNIST, after adversarial training, it has become quite similar to um, MNIST and ImageNet. So anyway, the information, it seems that, you know, maybe there's another clue that, um, Adversarial training somehow have, um, enforces this prior that um, in the direction that there are not much um, discriminative information, you know, the network should become invariant, ideally. And as you can see here, you know, we have gained a lot in terms of um, uh, high frequency robustness by doing adversarial training. And, and it contributes definitely to, to have, to have um, an overall increase in the robustness of uh, over networks. So um, if you're in interested uh, to know more a bit uh, about how adversarial training does that and or what sort of mechanism it exploits to uh, increase robustness of high frequency perturbations and, um, and some other experiments regarding um, uh, the, the spectral robustness, I would highly recommend you to take a look at our manuscript that is published on archive. Let's go to the second part of the talk, and I hope that this part would be a bit more exciting. So before starting uh, this part, I want to ask you a question. Maybe pause the video for some time and, and try to answer it for yourself. If I have a linearly separable data set and take one of the state of the art deep architectures, let's say DenseNet or ResNet, and try to train uh, on this linearly separable data set, what would I get? What do you expect to get in terms of the test performance? So some of you might have answered, look, we know from statistical learning theory that, you know, if you have a very complex classifier and apply it on a simple data set, you get overfitting. Meaning that you will get, in this case, you will get 100% training accuracy and 50% test accuracy. 
uh, binary classification. So 50% is the chance level. And on the other hand, some of you might complain, look, we know about this double descent phenomena. Okay, forget about uh, traditional um, statistical theory, but you know, we have this double descent phenomena, at least for deep neural networks. For a fact, you know, we know that they, they, are, they are quite good at um, classifying and learning, you know, very complex data sets like ImageNet. So we expect them to be good at learning this linearly separable data set too. Meaning it achieve, they achieve 100% uh, training and test accuracy. So neither of you uh, are right. Essentially, um, the right answer lies in the middle. For depending on how your data set, how, how actually your data set, uh, the, the, the two different classes are separated, you know, the, 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 the kind of um, like, the kind of, the, the, the direction of the discriminative features, how it is aligned in our three-dimensional Euclidean space, uh, you know, the classifiers, the state of the art neural networks, they might classify it uh, correctly, or they might not classify it correctly and overfit badly. So let's make this idea uh, more precise and have a systematic way, essentially, to measure uh, the effect that I just announced. So let's construct, again, a linearly separable data set, or actually a series of linearly separable data sets. So how, we do, how do we do it? We actually choose a direction V, which is actually in RD again. And, and then, you know, we, we, we create, you know, these two Gaussians that are, you know, separated, uh, their mean is separated along V, and, and they have variance along directions that are orthogonal, orthogonal to V. And of course, you know, one of them is class plus one and one of them is class minus one. And we know for a fact, you know, uh, the, uh, this hyperplane, uh, this separating hyperplane would be the perfect classifier to classify such data sets. Of course, um, there are as many as with uh, such data sets, but, and, and there are, you know, infinitely many, of course, but what they can do is that um, we can choose um, with to be, you know, to, from an orthogonal basis. For now, let's choose V as a DCD basis vectors, which are orthogonal, uh, they, are, they, are, they are orthogonal basis. So what we do is that we, we, choose, we pick, for example, um, the first uh, DCD basis vector, and then you know, we construct this DV data set, which is like uh, we have this V0, and then you know, we have uh, these two Gaussians. We take uh, V1, I mean, the next uh, DCT basis vector, and, and construct a data set. We take maybe V2, and, and then, uh, yeah, we construct a data set, and so on and so forth, till, of course, you know, because it's an orthonormal basis for uh, D-dimensional Euclidean space, we'll have uh, D of them. So if we pick, like, the, the last one, the last DCT basis vector, which corresponds to maybe to the highest frequency one, and then, you know, we construct this DB data set. So each of them, each of these are, each of one is a data set. And, um, and we have v, D of them. So we take one architecture, let's say, for example, uh, ResNet, and, and, and we train uh, on each of them separately. So, and we train them till we reach zero training error meaning, you know, 100% training accuracy. And then what we do is that we measure the test performance uh, for, for the train network, and then we report them. So maybe in this way, um, if we get like 100% um, on, on all of them, 100% test accuracy, then we can say, oh, okay, it seems that there is no bias, at least up to, you know, the choice of basis. And, and if we choose, um, and if they observe that, you know, it's like 50%, so we say that, okay, you know, it seems and for all of them, then it's that, okay, you know, the, the neural network actually cannot learn this um, simple linearly separable data set. So let's see in practice what we get. So here I have, um, I have computed uh, the procedure that I explained for five different models. The first model is a linear model, 
this logistic regression, and the other four models are state-of-the-art deep neural networks. So let's see first, you know, how, how, how we should read these plots. So generally, for example, if you, if you consider LUNET, um, each pixel corresponds to one data set and indeed one direction V. So for example, the one in the center, um, it corresponds to, to the first, um, to the first uh, eigenvector, sorry, to the first basis vector of our DCD, meaning, you know, the lowest frequency. And, and the ones in the corner, they correspond to the highest frequency DCD uh, basis vectors. And the color, uh, it determines the, the test performance that we get if we train the neural network on that data set. As you can see here for LUNET, as we go away from the center, the performance drops. What if we look at the linear classifier that is trained using the logistic loss, we see that you know, no matter how the direction V is aligned, we always get 100% test accuracy as expected. So linear classifiers, they do not have any sort of uh, bias, at least with respect to DCD basis. We get uh, a similar trend for VGG and dense net, uh, like the one that we got with low net. And it seems that dense net, like the, the almighty dense net, is, is even the worst. For most linearly separable data sets, it cannot learn anything, almost kind of 50% uh, performance. And there, there is this like in a, a narrow frequency band or a narrow um, density uh, basis vectors uh, that you know, it can learn uh, the data sets that are aligned, um, the linearly separable data sets that are aligned with um, those features. And for ResNet, there's no notion of high versus low frequencies, but, but, uh, there, but there are some holes in the spectrum. So we know for a fact that it says that, you know, half of the time, it, or, you know, okay, one fourth of the time, you know, it can learn um, linear, uh, linearly separable data sets and uh, other times it cannot learn. So today I, I won't talk much about the reason behind uh, such interesting phenomena. Uh, but just to give you a glimpse of um, what's going on, it seems that uh, the observed phenomenon, at least with respect to the DCT basis, is largely due to uh, the pooling layers or other dimensionality reduction, reduction blocks like strided convolutions. But if you are interested uh, to know more about uh, the reason and some uh, analysis, uh, please refer to the manuscript that I will put the link at the end. So the question now I want to ask is that um, it seems that the choice of DCT was an arbitrary choice here because he, I mean, in the first part, we chose DCT to study the robustness properties. But in that case, it, it, it would make sense because I um, mean, uh, DCT and images, you know, they, they are connected. You know, there are some theory that connects them together. But I mean, in this case, we are not dealing with images at least, you know, with, not with natural images. Um, so in this case, why, you know, DCT would be a good basis to capture any sort of bias? It really sounds like an arbitrary choice. So instead of that, let's try to find such a basis. So what we are looking is an ordered basis where, you know, uh, if, if, I, if I create if, an ordered basis like, uh, um, say, you know, some, some, something like v, V0, V1, till, of course, V D minus um, 1, in a way that uh, if, if I kind of align my linearly separable data set, the discriminative feature, with V0, I get the, the, the highest performance, highest uh, test accuracy. And then if I align with the, with the last, essentially, basis vector, I get uh, the lowest test accuracy. And by doing that, we can somehow capture the directional bias of deep architectures or the tendency of the network to discriminate the input data based on features aligned with certain directions. So, but the question is that, how to find them? Okay, let's assume that we have a data set that its discriminative feature is aligned um, uh, with B. So uh, like 
you know, we had uh, the, uh, these two kind of parallel Gaussians. And, and then, of course, you know, the, the, the optimal classifier would be uh, this uh, separating hyperplane that its normal is uh, essentially um, in the same direction as V. So um, I mean, recall that, you know, we talked about this hypothesis space, which, you know, each point corresponds to one set of weights, uh, in this case, theta um, of, of our neural network. And let's say yeah, we have this theta one, theta two, we have uh, theta three, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so then, uh, and, and for now, assume that you know, uh, the, like, we, we, I mean, we, we kind of approximate this one with the the, the, the normal to the decision boundary by you know the gradient with respect to the inputs of uh, of our classifier. So essentially, the question is that you know. Um, how many solution? How many of these solutions uh, that are in the, our solution space, uh, the gradient is actually aligned with V. If we have just you know one of these solutions or one of these hy uh, hypotheses, its gradient is um, aligned um, uh, with the direction V, then it means that it might be kind of difficult to find such solution. Uh, and, and you know it means that you know we, we might be not be able to train a neural network uh, to learn that data set. If you have, on the other hand, if you have a data set that, um, that you know, that there exist many solutions in our hypothesis space that, you know, their, their corresponding gradient with respect to input is aligned well with, uh, with the direction of V, then uh, it might mean that, you know, we have a higher chance of, of finding uh, and, and training our neural network to perform well uh, on that data set. And, and this is exactly something that is um, captured by, by this probability. Essentially, what we are interested in is uh, the, the kind of the volume of solutions that you know the, the inner product of V and uh, and, and the corresponding uh, gradient respect to the input uh, would be large enough. So if this probability is small, it means that you know we will have hard time uh, for a given V. If this probability is small, it means that you know we will have hard time to to learn that data set. And if uh, for, for a given V, uh, this probability is large, it means that you know, it's, it, it would be easier to find uh, solutions uh, for that data set. So essentially what we can do, we can kind of upper bound this quantity uh, using Markov inequality and, and relate uh, the direction V and, uh, and uh, the, the, actually the, the volume of the solutions um, uh, that can, uh, classify uh, the data set that, uh, that it's the same the feature it's aligned with B uh, to the eigenvectors of, uh, of a matrix uh, matrix uh, psi, which is indeed uh, just the covariance matrix of the gradient that reflected the input. Just to, uh, to remind you that, you know, how, how, how this connection is established. So essentially um, this quantity V transpose uh, psi V, it's lower bounded by the minimum eigenvalue of xi and upper bounded by the maximum eigenvalue uh, of xi. So it means that you know if v is aligned with the minimal eigenvector, uh, minimal eigenvector of xi, then uh, this probability would be a small, meaning that you no, know, there are not many solutions that you know the, the gradient with respect to the input it's aligned well with V. So meaning that you know it would be large to train a network on such data set. On on the other hand, you know, you know if we align V with the maximal eigenvalue of psi, then you know the bound the bound would be large. Meaning that you know it's it's more likely uh, to find uh, solutions with a data set that you know its its discriminative direction is aligned with the maximal eigenvector. So it seems that you know what we are looking in terms of the basis, like this ordered basis v zero to v d one d minus uh, one, actually can be established by looking the, at the eigenvectors um, of this matrix psi, which is the covar uh, covariance matrix of uh, of the gradient with respect to the input. So one can actually compute it uh, analytically for, for a simple uh, multi-layer perceptron or a kind of fully connected network. And you can find out that essentially the covariance matrix would be proportional to the identity matrix, uh, which means that you know, there is no directional bias for a single layer um, fully connected network, which is kind of expected. For deep neural networks, 
uh, it would be painful to compute them analytically if possible. So what we do is we use Monte Carlo sampling uh, to estimate psi, and then you know we, we do kind of uh, singular value decomposition, and and we take uh, the resulting eigenvectors um, as this neural anisotropy directions, or you know the, the, this ordered basis that captures the directional bias. So. Um, to, to, to be a bit more precise. So we kind of sample random networks uh, from other types of space. And, you know, we form uh, this, this sum of, you know, outer product of the gradients with respect to the inputs for this um, set of random weights that we have chosen. And, um, and then what we do is that, you know, we, this is like the, the, some estimation of psi, and what we do, we, we do a singular value decomposition, and, and we can find easily this, uh, uh, the corresponding eigenvalues and, uh, and, and the eigenvectors um, of psi, and essentially, like, they might be, you know, the basis that we were looking for. We'll see in a moment. But before that, let's see how this kind of basis vectors visually look like. So I have computed uh, the basis vectors for three architectures, uh, LONET, DRESDNET, DENSET here, and you now I have kind of depicted, you know, the first uh, five or six ones. As you can see here, uh, let, let's consider the first row that corresponds to LONET. As you can see here, um, the first one that the, the one that corresponds to the um, largest eigenvalue, it kind of looks like uh, the, 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 DC, the DC component, the DC component of the, uh, or the first component of, um, of DCD basis. The second one, it looks like this, maybe the second component, the, the, the third one, and so on and so forth. It seems that you know, the, 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 the basis vectors um, uh, that you know, we have found, it has a notion of frequency in it. And they look, uh, they, they resemble indeed uh, DCT basis. Uh, so maybe. Uh, so maybe you know the choice of DCT at the end was not a bad one for Lunet. While if you look at ResNet and DenseNet, you, you will see that you know um, for for ResNet you know it's, it it looks very different than uh, actually DCT, and for DenseNet while you know it has some notion of frequency in it, but you know it's far from uh, being DCT basis. But now the question, okay, we have, we have computed uh, this sort of ordered basis for um, the state of the art neural networks. But what we were looking at was that this basis should be ordered in terms of the performance that we get when we train um, a neural network um, on a data set that it's discriminative feature, it's aligned by these basis vectors. Uh, so let's see if, I mean, of course they are ordered by the, uh, by the magnet of the eigenvalues, but let's see if they are ordered by the performance uh, that we get when we train neural networks um, on them. So, so now here, what you see is that I have tried, I have, uh, I have done, you know, the, the similar experiment that we did with, uh, with DCT basis, but this time with this neural anisotropy direction NADs, uh, and, you know, I have constructed, you know, the linearly separable data set with, uh, with each of the NADs, and, and, and then, you know, I have trained a neural network on that and, you know, measured the test performance. So on the left, as you can see, uh, it's the, uh, for, for each network is the plot of the eigenvalues. And on the right hand, what you can see is the corresponding test performance that you get if you train a neural, a neural network um, on a data set that, uh, on a linearly separable data set that its uh, discriminative feature is aligned with the corresponding um, eigenvector. So for example, if we, if we look at the eigenvector, the first eigenvector that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue, and we train a network um, on a data set that its discriminative feature is aligned with V0, uh, we get something that has 100% test accuracy. While if we take the last eigenvector, the one that corresponds to the, low, the smallest eigenvalue, and we train a, a data set that its discriminative feature is aligned with Vd minus one, then uh, you know, in terms of accuracy, we get like 
just the chance level, meaning that you know the network has overfit. This, we observe a similar trend also for ResNet. Uh, I mean, uh, up to some, some anomalies that you can see here, but the general trend is, is very similar. So it means that, you know, we have found um, a, an ordered basis that captures the tendency of the network in, in, in learning uh, linearly separable data sets. So, um, so far we have seen, okay, we, 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 have, we have managed to capture this sort of in, uh, directional bias for linearly separable data set. But what does it imply for uh, more complex tasks? Because, I mean, you can say that, oh, okay, I'm a practitioner. You know, I, I don't care about, you know, linearly separable data set. Who cares? Uh, I, I, I want to train these networks on complex data sets. So, uh, Indeed, this is, this, is a, this is an ongoing research question, so I don't have a definite answer uh, to this question, but I want to share with you two observations that suggest that, uh, you know, the NADs, are, they, they, they play some role in um, when you train these neural networks on more complex data sets too. So the first observation uh, suggests that the NADs somehow determine the relative import importance of uh, different features um, of the data set. Um, okay, uh, it, it means that, you know, I mean, of course, you know, for the data set, let's say like CIFAR10, there might be many features that the neural network can use to discriminate um, between different classes. Okay, it might, it might, it, 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 it might have to use like all of them or it might have to use a subset of them. But, but anyway, it seems that the NADs somehow uh, give some relative importance to these features. So to kind of verify this hypothesis, what we did uh, is similar to this flipping experiment that we did with DCT, but this time with respect to the NADs basis. So we have trained um, four networks on original CIFAR10 data set. And also we have trained uh, the same architectures on, on the flip uh, CIFAR10 this time flip with respect to the NADS basis. And as you can see uh, in the green bars, uh, the accuracy, um, the test accuracy on the flip C14 data set is much lower than the test accuracy on the original, uh, compared to the original C14 data set. And, and, and note that, you know, this operation of flipping, it's a, it's a kind of lossless uh, operation. It does not throw away information. It's just a kind of a rotation in this uh, d-dimensional Euclidean space. So, um, so it seems that you know by kind of breaking this sort of alignment of features in the dataset with NADs, um, we have managed to make neural networks not to learn or not, not to learn satisfactorily um, the kind of. Um, the task at hand, which was like uh, classifying C410 data set. The second observation is about, um, is about like the order in which, you know, the features are learned when, uh, when we learn, you know, when we train these networks on more complex data sets. To, to demonstrate that, what we did is, was uh, performing a poison experiment. And in a poison experiment, actually, we kind of poisoned the training data, in this case, the C410 data, uh, but we test on the original CIFAR10 data. Uh, so the way that we poison is by adding um, each time one of the uh, one of the, say the, the NAD basis vectors. So, for example, when we add, you know, the the, the NAD the, the first NAD, the one that corresponds to like you know the the feature that is uh, easiest to learn for these networks. Um, and, and, and then, you know, we train on, on this poison C410 data set. And then whenever we test uh, on, on the original uh, C410 data set, we get a, a pretty bad accuracy. It seems that, you know, the network somehow latches into um, uh, this poison signal because it, it has a kind of, you know, tendency to, uh, to learn uh, that kind of feature. And it ignores the, or, the, the original features of the CIFAR10 data set. While when we add, the, instead of like the first one, we add the last NAT, the one that, you know, the network, I mean, does not learn it or kind of does not, uh, does not see it, you know, when it's present in the data set, the, the bad NATs. Um, it seems that it has 
almost no effect, uh, no poisoning effect. And you know, still, you know, we can manage a very good accuracy um, on CIFAR 10. So it's that kind of, you know, it ignores that one and, you know, it tries to learn um, the original CIFAR 10 uh, features. Okay, if you are interested to know more about these NADs and uh, you know to, to, to see some more, some more visuals or some more experiments, uh, please refer to uh, our manuscript that is available online. Okay, to wrap up what we talked about today, so in the first part I talked about you know the the robustness properties um, of, of the state of the art deep neural networks. Uh, in particular, the uh, directional robustness uh, of, of the networks trained on, uh, natu on image datasets. And in the second part, I talked about you know, the, some uh, preference of the networks in uh, learning some datasets and not learning some other datasets. So one might wonder that, you know, okay, so uh, there might be some connections between uh, these two, between, you know, the idea of directional robustness and, uh, and NATS. Of course, it's worth investigating, and, you know, this is one of the uh, active line of research that we are pursuing. Uh, but still, you know, I don't have a very um, uh, kind of um, clear idea of, you know, how, how these two things are related to each other. Also, we have not to forget about the role of optimization algorithms because most of the, the times the inductive bias that we observe is a combination of the architecture and the algorithm. So in many cases, we, we just use the first order uh, optimization algorithm like SGD, but it might be interesting to see that how this inductive biases change um, if you use some like higher order optimization algorithms like, like Newton methods. Also, uh, the implication of um, our work is, uh, is, is beyond essentially just mere um, analysis. It can have some um, uh, potential applications. For example, in neural architecture search, uh, we might want to incorporate some inductive bias in our architecture. So one might be able to use NADs uh, for certain type of uh, biases to incorporate them in, in the architecture. And as a criteria to, you know, to, to search for, for, the, uh, for the right uh, architecture. Also, something that, you know, pe people are becoming uh, more and more interested in, uh, because it has many, many applications, is uh, to actually predict generalization gap solely based on the training data. Because, you know, sometimes, you know, having test data, it's expensive or it's, uh, it's, it's impossible. So we are interested to have some confidence about uh, the generalization gap um, based on only you know some statistics of our uh, training samples, um, and, and to make sure that you know we have not just overfitted <laughs> to, to to our training data points. So. Um, if you are interested in, in what I talked today or you have some questions about you know, what I've presented today, uh, please feel free uh, to shoot me an email. Uh, I, I will try my best to answer um, uh, as soon as I can. Um, also, I guess you know, now we have some time for some questions uh, in the Q&A session. So uh, thanks a lot. Okay, so thanks uh, Seth Mohsen for his very interesting talk.
So now we have uh, time for a couple of question and answer. Please uh, uh, type in your um, questions in the, the right bar and we will publish it. So uh, let's go to the first question. Okay, so this is the first question. Okay, uh, so first I want to thank you, uh, thank the organizers again. Uh, I, I, can, I can imagine how much effort <laughs> you have done to organize in these weird situations. I want to thank you again. Uh, so let's start with the question. Um, of course, I mean, everything is somehow connected, you know, because we are talking about like, when we talk about deep learning, of course, you know, different aspects of deep learning, they are connected to each other. Uh, but in particular, um, one can say that, you know, of course, robustness and safety, they are connected because, you know, if you have a more robust model, you know, it should be uh, safer to use in uh, like safety critical applications. And uh, also it has been, uh, shown that you know more robust models seems to be more in interpretable. Um, of course, you know it seems that robustness hurts the generalization as we know um, so far. Uh, but anyway, you know it seems that there is some I guess connection because you know at, at the end you know the underlying uh, beast that we are studying is the same, and you know of course you know there might be some mechanisms. Uh, actually driving, you know, all of these uh, um, different concepts. But, you know, if you are asking about the current literature, no, this connection is not clear yet. Even, you know, the connection between robots and generalization. There have been many kind of empirical works trying to connect these two, but still, you know, we are not sure how uh, robustness is connected to generalization. Even we don't know that you know either you know robust and generalization are kind of if there is a trade-off or no. I mean robust and generalization essentially they are um, actually the same concept but you know measured in different ways. So it's still not clear. But but I mean the, I mean the ongoing research actually it's uh, uh, it's going on and and I I think that it will become clear you know, in the following years that you know the connect the connection between these different concepts. So, I mean, depends, you know, what do we mean by robustness in, you know, this kind of distributed setting? You know, it's, um, uh, I mean, do you, I mean, most of the times in, in federated learning, you know, what we care about, it's like, um, most kind of robustness in training data, I mean, training time, like, you know, when, when we have, um, you know, a bunch of data or, you know, we, we kind of gather all this kind of gradient information from different, uh, Clients, so we want to make sure that this gradient information is uh, um, is kind of faithful. Mm, but I don't know. You know, I'm, I mean, can you can you make it a bit more uh, precise? What do you mean uh, about the about like federated learning? I mean, uh, is it like uh, in a, a test time you are thinking about? But I, I mean, I can imagine a training time so that you know that's more, mostly kind of you know poisoning and and such. Uh, kind of topics, I'm not sure that, you know, this notion of adversarial robustness um, can be directly applied in, in these settings. Oh, okay, so I can go for the next question. Robustness is anything good? Okay. Um, oops. Yeah, I mean, there, there have been a lot of work, I mean, on these topics, I mean, there is, there are a lot of works on LSTMs. I guess there are also works uh, on these new uh, models called transformers. Yeah, there are all sorts of things. I mean, are, for example, in NLP, um, usually we are dealing with uh, this recurrent model. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense, you know, to, uh, to study robustness um, in these settings. I mean, there, there are many, many work that you can find uh, in the literature, you know, that study robustness uh, in the context of, um, I mean, the current models. Mm. Can you a bit be more specific? Uh, because uh, what, what do you mean like fine tuning already trained? I mean, fine tuning uh, for what? I mean, fine tuning with what essentially? 
do you mean like um, fine tuning with new data? Do you mean fine tuning with um, with adversarial examples? I mean, uh, what do you mean? I mean, fine tuning is quite general, but fine tuning on what? Okay, is there any question or the the previous the previous uh, participant can can you elaborate on your question? Okay, so maybe I can ask a question. Sure. Uh, so uh, well, my area is is not artificial intelligence. I'm working on formal methods, but recently people in formal methods approached in the learning especially from the robustness point of view. So uh, so my question is how we can reduce the inductive biases. So in a recent work, we started uh, with a PhD student to use uh, actually multi-agent logical systems um, to aggregate the knowledge and then to check, for example, with uh, these different knowledge produced by this deep networks are logically consistent together in, in the multi-agent setting or not. Um, can you, um, you know, do you have any insight on the, those works in, in the formal methods and in your area? Uh, yeah, honestly, I'm, I'm a bit like, I also kind of far from formal methods. Uh, I mean, definitely um, there, I mean, I, I, I am hearing from people also, also here in our department, there are a couple of people working on uh, kind of connecting uh, essentially formal methods either to robustness and also like to uh, kind of extract inductive biases of deep architectures. Um, the thing that, you know, uh, I've been hearing a lot is that um, those methods are not that scalable, at least, I mean, for deep, very deep neural networks. They are come somehow computation expensive and of course you know at the end you know you have to have some very sometimes very strong assumptions like you know the type of nonlinearity on or you know the type of architecture you are studying uh but they i, I mean personally i see that you know there, there might be some potentials i mean it's, it's always kind of fascinating to to bring methods from other area of you know research and try to kind of apply on the problems in uh, in, in in machine learning, um, but yeah, I, I, since you know I'm not familiar with the literature there, um, yeah, I, I cannot say more than that. Uh, to me, it's like yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I'm I'm a bit more familiar with the works that you know I said you know apply try, they try to apply formal methods on robustness and study robustness of neural networks because at the end it's a kind of verification problem, so it makes sense. Uh, uh, to use those methods, but usually they are computationally expensive. Um, and as I said, you know, they, they require some strong assumptions on the type of architecture uh, used. Question here? Yeah. Um, So, uh, so I mean, of course, you know, always you can backpropagate, but the backpropagation is not the problem itself. I mean, of course, you know, you can you can imagine that, you know, if I have an image classifier and uh, let's say, you know, I have an image of a cat and, you know, it's kind of classified as a cat. Of course, you know, always I can take some image of a dog, so some uh, image of a dog, and then, you know, add the difference between the Im that image of a dog and, you know, my, my cat image and add it to the cat image. And of course, you know, it will be classified uh, as a dog because, you know, it's just, just I added the difference. So, um, so always, you know, there exists some perturbation. I mean, even you don't need back propagation, you know, to find the perturbation. But the question is that how large this perturbation is? Um, I mean, of course, you know, you always can back propagate and find the perturbation, but the question is that how large this perturbation will be. Um, the, I mean, whatever we are doing now, it's like what we are trying to make this, prop, this, this perturbation kind of, you know, uh, as large as possible by, by making, you know, decision boundary further away from data points. So, um, so you see, of, of course, you know, if, you ha if I have a classifier that, you know, the data point is very far from the decision boundary, 
um, in two ways it helps um, to kind of to prevent you know back propagation uh, to kind of find effective perturbation first since you know it is further away from decision boundary uh, so um, you know back propagation is like relies on like you know i mean we use kind of a gradient descent uh, to find the perturbation so it means that you know if we are further away from decision boundary uh gradient descent will have um harder time to find the perturbation first and also since you know the uh, the decision boundary is further away from data points so the minimal perturbation has uh increased significantly so even you know if the attacker uh is able to find a perturbation uh he or she will find uh, a quite large one so there might be no worry because I said, you know, even even, you know, if you have a network that is, you know, what are 100 percent robust, you know, always you can find a perturbation. I mean, the difference between uh, two images from two opposite classes. So, yeah, so, so that that's the way, you know, that's the hope of, you know, the research on robustness. Saying that, uh, I have to say that we don't know what is like um, if, if there is a limit to this distance to decision boundary, if, if there is an um kind of upper bound on that we don't know how 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 far we can make the decision boundaries from data points so that that's the most imp most important question to ask um there are some like kind of impossibility results some so, sort of kind of upper bounds on um on robustness but this is not something um uh, i mean it's kind of debatable you know there are i mean there are people still i believe that you know we can make uh, networks super robust by making decision boundaries really far away from data points. There are some people they believe that you know it might not be possible to do, and there is an upper limit on that. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's still you know either we have to. Uh, I guess the robustness research will uh, go on till we reach uh, either you know a negative result saying that okay you know we cannot achieve robustness, or till we achieve uh, you know very robust models. So I guess till then, you know, uh, the robustness research will go on. But as I said, you know, back propagation is not a problem anyway. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, thanks for the for the clarification. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't thought about it. Um, I don't know. I mean. I mean. I mean. Without having access to the data, um, it, it depends. You know. Sometimes we have access to the data. I mean, at least we know that this type of data that is used. And we might, for example, we know that oh, okay, some classifier is trained on images. Okay, we might not have access to to the to the exact data set that they used for training. But still, you know, we know. Okay, you know, these are these are like. Uh, images of, I don't know, trees and uh, trees and, I don't know, tables. Or, you know, we know that these are the images of digits. Um, so if we have some knowledge of, you know, the data set, maybe we can do something. Maybe uh, there is something because, uh, I mean, maybe then we can kind of, at the end, you know, measuring robustness is like measuring distribution shift. So it's like, yeah, I mean, maybe if we, if we already know that, you know, there is some, um, we have some, knowledge about you know the data set that is used i mean we might not have access to the exact data set, but you know we have you know some knowledge i mean what is the task and you know we have some data set that is different than you know the the original one uh so there there, there will be ways you know to measure but you know now you see that you know we, we can measure the robustness with respect to this new data set but we have to kind of um take into account the difference between the distributions of um of our kind of test data set and you know uh, the original kind of training data set that um, kind of people used. Um, I I'm, I'm not aware of any. I mean, I'm trying to think of any work in this area. I I I, I mean I, I I don't know. I mean maybe there is, but uh, but yeah, I, I'm not aware of any of them. But I, I guess it can be an interesting question, um, and and sounds kind of quite challenging. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, 
uh, about these optimization algorithms which you mentioned, um, what kind of optimization you need? For example, depending on the on the input. So, do you have, for example, a high dimensional and a sparse input to you know you want to uh, process? Or, um, I mean, there are different sort of optimizations techniques. What sort of op optimization techniques uh, usually you you encounter in the analysis of the robustness? Uh, uh, robustness part, okay. Um... I mean, do you mean like, you know, the optimization problems to find like perturbations? Yes, for example. Uh, I mean, um, you, you see that you know, most of the times, I mean, even, you know, for training neural networks, it seems that, you know, very basic optimization techniques like, you know, just gradient descent works pretty well. There's the case, the same actually holds here uh, for, for our case. I mean, for finding actually adversarial perturbations. Um, it seems that even you don't need to care about like, you know, what are the kind of constraints, you know, I mean, you can just, just, for example, use like projected gradient descent if you have some constraint and it works pretty well. Um, so I said at the end, you know, it just boils down, you know, to just computing the gradient. Um, and, and as I said, you know, if it is, you have some constraint, you just project it. So they're not like kind of concerned, like, oh, okay, you know, I have like some, some sort of, for example, a sparse kind of constraints, or even like, you know, I have um, some like regularizer term or planalizer term that, you know, it encourages sparsity or something like that. Even, you know, in those cases, you can just use uh, a very simple projected gradient descent and it seems that it works pretty well. Um, it is a bit kind of surprising because uh, the optimization problems that we are dealing with, they are highly nonlinear and actually they are highly non-convex. But it seems that, you know, they, um, if you use just, just like simple naive gradient descent, uh, it works pretty well. And even, you know, if someone goes to more kind of sophisticated methods, um, like Newton method, for example, I, in the early days of adversarial um, research, people were using, um, uh, uh, LBFGS, like which is this kind of quasi Newton method, like a second order method to find perturbations, and and then you know people realize that you know just just gradient descent would do the job. You know you don't need even like to to, uh, to kind of bother yourself uh, uh, with, with really like such kind of complex methods. So yeah, so I say I say you know this is this is re really like you know the method you use is just most of the times just gradient descent and it works pretty well. This also concludes the morning part of the second day. Thanks all participants for attention. And thank you very much for your presentation and patience. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I want to thank again uh, the organizers and also uh, the audience. Thanks. Okay. Have a good day.